Hello and welcome to the 36th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Thursday the 23rd of January 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we return to our reading of Boss Level Chapter 9, Republican Democracy, and talk all about the importance of the international and the hurdles we face in building one. This week I have the new patrons Leo Silkberger, W O, Andrew Climbing, Chessnuff, and Grant Gallagher to thank. If you too would like to keep the good ship Alpha afloat, why not join the Patreon Gang Gang? From only $5 a month, you get two new Patreon only episodes each month, and the right to vote on the Reading Group series. If you don't have any spare dough, just spread the good commie word and give me a nice 5 star iTunes review. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel. And make sure to like, subscribe, and share. And you can find me on Twitter and Facebook too. Okay, to the discussion. Uh, let's go in reverse umbilical cord direction. We got Puya. Puya, how's it going? It's going, it's going well, Tom. How about you? Good. Next, Good. we have got the Varninator all the way from sunny uh, Sahara Desert. Derek, how's it going? Uh, pretty good, although I am in the Moab Desert, and uh, it's not sunny. It's fucking cold. Excellent. Next, we've got Kyle Thompson. Kyle is joining us all the way from Botswana. How's it going, Kyle? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, Botswana is, is real different than I expected, honestly. Finally, we've got Lex Sof, who are joining us from the third uh-huh. moon of Venus. How's it oh, going? Yes, of course. I love the third moon of Venus. Yeah, the gravity is lovely this year. Now, what's reverse umbilical Yeah, what the cord? fuck is that, Tom? What, 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 what's the deal with that? Kyle, I know you did this somehow. <laughs> yeah, Kyle, you're involved. <laughs> yeah, just blame Kyle. Just blame Kyle. Okay. <laughs> no. I'm up with that. Up, up with that. I'm down for that or up for that, but I'm not up with it. Okay, so I'm going to read the first one here. Number 12. Capitalism is an international system, and both the capitalist class and the working class are international classes. The nation state is merely a firm within the international capitalist system. It is just as much vulnerable to the flight of capital and disinvestment as are individual firms. The working class can therefore only lay collective hands on the means of production and decide democratically on their use on a world scale. The first and foremost lesson of the short 20th century is the impossibility of socialism in a single country. But it's the same reasons mean that it is impossible to have political power of the working class or the Democratic Republic for more than a few months in a single country. The struggle for workers' power is therefore a struggle for global democratic republic and immediately for continental democratic republics. There is an important implication of this point. It is strategically necessary, as far as possible, to fight for a majority for working class politics on the international scale before attempting to take power in any single country. Taking the power in any single country, unless the Workers' Party is on the verge of at least a continental majority, is likely to lead to disaster. I invited the people from Navarra Media onto it, but they... They decline me. So who else wants to talk about this? I mean, I both, I think I agree with it, but when I really think about that last bit, it's like, so we never even start really. Like at what point would you know when we're at the verge of a continental majority politically? Meaning what? Like how would we know that we would have a continental right vote? Well, I think we talked about this last time. I think you could just do a survey. I think I might've brought up the uh, left-wing communism debates in 1920, where Lenin was responding to some German and Dutch communists. And, you know, part of the German and Dutch response was to be like, hey, y'all are so dependent on us for your revolution succeeding. Why didn't we coordinate like a whole lot more? And I don't know, when you read through the story of the Russian Revolution, you can kind of see how the internal dynamics of things you know, propelled people in a certain direction. 
And it is hard to imagine what that coordination really looks like. But the left wing, you know, the left comms have a point. This, you know, and, you know, retroactively, this became a big Trotskyist selling point is that, you know, we have to sync this up in advance. I guess that requires that countries kind of, you know, be in all in the same time zone in a way, you know, where you have like a dynamic that's unfolding across borders outside of that regular, like, quote, combined in uneven way that historical phenomena tend to actually, you know, progress across similar polities, even in the same region. So this is a super big ask, even if I do agree with it. I, I think about, though, the other end of that LEFTCOM debate, the Bordigas' answers to Stalin was not only did you need to coordinate more, that the nationalities need to be represented as nationalities with independent interests within the international, which implies that you haven't actually transcended nationalism, that internationalism is not a transcendence of nationalism. This is actually kind of a problem, though, because both capital, both the working and bourgeois are not national classes, even if they have national interest in the apparatus firms and capital. But they have cultural and ethno ties that just aren't addressed in this at all. Like, so let's think about what would happen here. Let me see. What's the line? To fight for a majority for class politics on the international scale before power in any country. So there are current existing political structures at the moment which are national and people have both political and kind of you know emotional ties to say like in the uk the labor party or in you know france the socialist party or in america to the democrat party to get normal just regular joes out in the street who aren't like political weirdo commies like us to say well, well we gotta organize first on an international scale before we even bother doing anything like that's a very very big ask it, like that's a an incredibly large change in left tactics like i think there are a lot of structural impediments to this what, what do people think yeah no i think tom tom is kind of getting on something like when i'm debating people on this in the left um in particular anarchists they tend to say like well how can you have a revolution all at once you know inter on an international scale and you know, somebody at one point made the joke of uh, shitty Marxists want socialism in one country, anarchists want socialism in one municipality. You know what I mean? And so they kind of tend to go small, whereas internationalists tend to go big. But silly jokes aside, I think you need something like a, an international. And I think Nick Nair gets into this a little bit later on. Like you have to have like an international body or socialist international of some kind that can step in and be a body of for like a world republic if you will whereas the national party is like the kind of local branch of that like if you don't have an international at all you can't take power is what mcnair is saying and that's where we're at right now we're at like we're at like step zero i think if we look at this though in a in a deeper sense we have some major things that you some major hurdles that are are, are not easily reconciled um, the ethno-linguistic tensions are a big one. They've been a big one. They, they are part of what contributed to the downfall of the Soviet Union, even if there are a million other things. I mean, one of the things that you have to look at with the Soviet Union was Stalin trying to maintain, you know, independent ethno-nationalist lines where everyone got their own, like, autonomous zone, that leading to the creation of nationalist tensions that the Soviet Union didn't want to deal with, even within their own bloc, not, not even dealing in the larger international. And then them basically trying to export Russian culture as a default culture to fix it. So you looked at the Russification of the situation in the Soviet Union, which if you really study, no one can defend. The thing is, that didn't just happen in the Soviet Union. It's also in, is still ongoing in China in very ugly ways. We have internationalist orgs standing for that even and trying to pretend that it's a conspiracy, even though it comes out of this logic that isn't easily reconciled just by having an international republic because it's like regional tensions within a federal state. And we've already said that we don't want a federated state. So that's actually going to be hard to negotiate. You can have an international organization, but what international organizations have been traditionally on the left 
is largely coalitions of national parties with their own interests who somewhat coordinate on an international level. And that's not just been true for the communist internationals. It's also been true for the socialist. What you tend to see with these international bodies is either something like the common turn where one of these parties is really calling the shots and firing off orders and everyone goes, yes, Russia. Or you have situations where not just like power and sovereignty, but also like, I don't know, popular legitimacy is highly dispersed. And I'm thinking about the, you know, kind of liberal cosmopolitan institutions like the European Union or the United Nations. You know, these not only are impotent to stop things from happening in the Hobbesian anarchy between states, but also like, I I guess the European Union's economic union has a bit more teeth. So I want to put that aside. But also, you know, the further that you get from, it's, it seems like, I'll say, the further that you get from sort of municipal governance or something, you know, the more likely it is that these things are highly, highly alienated from popular will in the way that McNair wants to, you know, be in touch with. And I would almost say it's a sort of an inherent problem because if you have power in your everyday life, that would be, you know, in a sense, it's a sort of local relationship because you're a single person in a particular place. I mean, I know I'm I'm making it real zooming out and bong rip, but I've been sort of reading some, reading some communizer literature recently and they end up, you know, if they're trying to do anything productive, rather localist, much like the anarchist Sophia was talking about. And part of the reason why is because you know, they're trying to be embodied individuals in the place they are, right? And if you turn towards the social, you realize you too are part of the social as a particular person in a particular place. And, th- you know, they, listen, they also advocate trying to build broader networks, especially if you think like an activist. And if you're trying to build a popular power in the social structures you see around you, they're around you. You live somewhere, probably unless you can jet set around, which is cool, but not the situation most people are in. I think that's maybe like the inherent tension of trying to build, you know, popular power, democratic legitimacy, even measuring said democratic legitimacy and, and can carrying out, like having the mandate to carry out a political project, not just where you are, but in a continental block. Yeah. Like is McNair kind of saying that, you know, immediately, when you have these international scale revolutions, say like, I mean, continental wide revolutions at the one time, that they all become essentially drop their nationhood and it becomes a communist area. Is is that what he's saying? That seems so, sort of ambiguous. You know, I've seen more like, I don't know, Stalinophilic kind of ways of looking at this or even, you know, just sort of Kautskyist ways of looking at this that assume that national boundaries aren't going to be transgressed immediately. But then, you know, there's also more uh, Trotskyist and left communist sort of internationalist ways of looking at this that imagine that, you know, that it will be more of a sort of melange. And then there's even decolonial ways of looking at this that, you know, actually we're going to carve things up maybe even more to get rid of these settler colonial territories or, or to untie certain nationalities from broader nationalisms or something like i i think the the most important thing in this idea of the international is that you know the implementation of that democratic republicanism on such a scale it would have to on some level to lead to large amounts of redistribution from certain areas to other areas given how unequal continents are and that would lead to in the core countries that are basically being asked to ship resources and stuff away that would definitely lead to certain elements of certain countries kind of being a bit pissed off with it like we see with the brexit party in the eu it just seems that it's a that's a trickier thing to manage than i think is being pointed out here well i think people could maintain their um standards of living while growing the undeveloped areas you could have no growth in the developed areas and then use the and then you know you could designate a certain growth rate you know use that to you know like bring up the less developed areas 
you can do that, Puya, but the politics of it aren't as simple as saying, oh, you just stay where you are. You work hard and ship everything off to Slovenia. You know, the politics of it is is a different thing. Well, I think, you know, you're still, Slovenia is still using the same amount of labor hours, but I think like the physical products, you know, like it's not like a thing of working hard because it's like, I mean, like we're going to assume we have zero percent unemployment and uh, everybody's working full time. You mean like two two hours a week? What, what's fault? What are we talking about here? Oh, I mean, whatever. You know, like however much they want to work. I mean, however much uh, consumption they want to have and however much growth rate they want to have. Well, I, I got some fishing to do. I wanted to go sailing. Yeah. Screw yeah. this shit. Let the Slovenians lie in their own <laughs> filth, I say. Oh, geez, Tom. How are we going to start a continental democratic republic with you dishing on the Slovenians already? The Slo- Slovenia is so nice as well. It's really lovely, Slovenia. I'm only taking the piss. We could, you know, if everywhere was like Slovenia, we'd be having a laugh. But yeah, I think you could like this, uh, like everybody could like say how many la- hours they want to work. And then you know how many labor hours you have available, available, and then you know how much product you can produce with that amount of labor hours, and then you have uh, so everybody decides on a growth rate, and then that percentage of the product is invested, and okay. the rest of it is consumed. Puyo, you make me want to kill all the engineers. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> my national <laughs> <education here is laughs> like, like rustificate them. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't I, like, you know, I'm not, you're not making anti communist points. I'm just like, you're speaking at such a high level that I'm like, yeah, that'd be great if no one resisted, which they will. So, <laughs> well, here, well, hopefully, got... hopefully they don't. Because, I mean, like, I uh, wouldn't uh-huh. resist it. I, I'd be like, you know, we, these people, like, we need to get these, you know, like, people need to eat. Well, hopefully they don't, says Puya. And if my, like, rate of consumption isn't going down, then, like, you know, if I'm still having like the same consumption, then you know I think that should be fine. I have something to give out about. Last week, Puya, you slipped into when well, I don't know when I was spaced out. You said that like the Soviet Union was a type of socialism, and you know what? I, I, I said to myself, I have to bring that up. And this is like where it's going to come up. Like, okay. honest to God, I think like you can make probably a better case for having socialism. In, in the Scandinavian countries. Yet no one well, says why do you that. Say that. Well, because the distribution was pretty good. They had good health care. They had good education. They had essentially full employment. And you had freedom of speech. You didn't get sent to the gulag. You know, their standard delivered was, was high. You know, the very basic stuff that Marx says about socialism is not, he never talks about distribution, really. He talks about workers control the means of production. And you didn't have that. And to me, that's the basic, you know, it had none of the political element. You know, it did not combine the political and the social. It was a redistributive, weird form of whatever we want to call it. But socialism, I just can't call it that. I literally cannot call it that. It's like the antithesis well, of what Marx was talking about. Well, I think I think it is. I mean, well, I only think it is because, like, I mean, it just worked like completely differently. Like, it just didn't work the same. Like, but that yeah. doesn't mean that it's just because the law of value didn't operate doesn't mean it's it's socialism. It just means it's like the law of value didn't operate in Peru and in, under Inca, Inca or whatever times. It's yeah. like, but that doesn't mean that it was socialism. Yeah, but that's like a different thing. That's not capitalism. That's like primitive society. It wasn't that primitive. That, I mean, I think it's like quite a hierarchical like, society without money, with command and control. You could make the same argument for you know the Incas, I think, as you could make for Stalin's Russia. Was that like was the Incas like on the transition to a slave economy? They were. Uh, they economy. Uh, this is a were they a slave economy? Because I know uh, there was like a period. I don't in think between, they were a slave like, economy, Derek. They weren't a slave I know there economy. Was like, I know there was like a period in between uh, like primitive societies and like when chieftains first. And then there was like the head of the when um what is it called? We horticulture. Like, we just talk about anthropology for real. Like there's more than <laughs> one period. <laughs> so. Well, I well I mean I'm not an expert on the subject, but like maybe somebody else can kind of. But I think there was like well, a period th- where like horticulturized and then like. But it wasn't like full slave society. They had a highly, you know, a class society with with high complexity, 
with like high levels of like state kind of planning. You know, it wasn't just like a horticultural society and far from it. They were they they didn't have uh, money. They had command and control type for certain elements of it. But you know, I just I just think that it's I just think it's so far from socialism. You socialism know, requires in. some kind of functioning democratic institutions like Thac. Yeah, and and uh, you know, a, 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 a continental wide democratic republic is less of a tall order than a six person stack. But co <laughs> communists have a problem, you know, with <laughs> democratic institutions and sticking to them because we're too busy talking over each other, right, babe? Yeah. Anyway, Kyle, <laughs> I want to hear what Kyle has to say about all this. Screw Kyle, send him to the gulag. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom, stop being actually kind of socialist, but not. <laughs> oh no i mean uh like what so what's the subject now like is it is it the nature of the class nature or the 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 social nature of the ussr or is it the sorry it, all yeah. of the above it's what kyle wanted to say in, in whatever society. you want to say how's, how's uh, about kyle how's about kyle talk about if you want to respond to this bullshit i just brought up and then work it back into the other one and then we'll go back to the book okay sorry. yeah i like i i tend to agree more with the point of view that the, the the USSR was not socialist, but of course you can see the, like the numerous ways in which their society kind of Im imitated social democracy. Yeah, I, I would prefer not to think about socialism as just the provision of various uh, material goods to a, a wide section of society and like a suppression of inequality because yeah, again, there is no, there is no democratic freedom there, and uh, as as for the the uh, Incan society, like yeah, it was it was very sophisticated. Like they had um, a really uh, complex logistical system that they they ran to provide like supply caches to the entire empire, and like they their engineering in terms of like uh, bridge building and, and infrastructure maintenance was incredibly sophisticated. Um, I, I don't think it could be called a primitive society by like any reasonable stretch. Uh, it's it's just just not plausible at all. Just, just 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 to clarify, like it was it was definitely a complex society. There's there's no doubt. Also, it may have been a slave society if you consider serfs slaves. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And like it, there's there's no question. It was like intensely hierarchical and in a very top down way and that that like political freedom was not a thing for the common people <laughs> they got provided for better than in some empires uh especially given the geographical restrictions that existed in that empire but uh they definitely did not have political freedom or or even yeah even as you said uh, uh freedom over their own labor well uh well i only think that like you know, and like the jargon, you know, like the relations of production were different in the USSR. Yeah, I think that one of the things that a lot of communists who don't know a lot about anthropology kind of get sort of in trouble with is that they don't, they, they kind of group together indigenous society, like pre quote unquote modern society into like an amorphous, like noble sab savage kind of myth where everything was egalitarian and great. And a lot of this was done by Engels, but Engels was working off of the best research at the time. And so like, if you look at Inca or Aztec, for example, like Aztec society had better infrastructure than contemporary London. Like London at the time of the Aztec empire was like, they had better infrastructure. And so uh, a lot of the political and economic forms that you, that you see like confederacy, for example, come from indigenous societies. So it's not like uh there's varying degrees of equality of, of hierarchical systems versus very democratic systems. Like it's very different depending on what indigenous nation you're, t you're discussing. The main thing, reason why I got on stack is I wanted to uh, talk, discuss something that Derek brought up when it comes to linguistic and ethnic tensions in, in an international communist international. The best way we can do that is like, I do think we need some kind of international body that does have teeth more so than the UN it needs to be able to intervene if necessary, but I think the the amount that it intervenes should be much more limited than it was in, uh, let's say, the common turn, for example. And I think like direction for what the what the communist international can and can't do should come from the localities. It shouldn't just be an exporting of like 
directions from Russia or directions from North America or directions from whatever, right? Like it should be all voices below it have a say in what it makes it makes up and what direction and what it can and can't intervene in. And then it only intervenes if certain conditions are met, if that makes any sense. I'm kind of like thinking of like a, the kind of beers model that we've talked about in the past, as far as like limited intervention of like the higher body. And then beyond that, like I think localities should be able to keep, you know, evolve their own culture and uh, engage in cultural exchange and uh, as much as they want to, you know, and that way we try to minimize tensions and minimize like the repeating versification, basically. I, 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 I would just say like to that point, the difficult thing there is how do you do that while still not being a federation? That's that's the really difficult question. Yeah, because he's totally against federation. Yes, un unquestionably, yeah. Yeah, and so this this is a form that we've maybe not yet worked out, and we have to hope that there might be something slightly new under the sun, even though it, it won't come from Planet X. It will have something to do with the institutions the, or the broad categories of institutions we're already familiar with. If it's going to come from anywhere, it's going to come from the third you know, Venus. Lexi, <laughs> number 13, take it away. Further, it is impossible to have full class political consciousness, i.e. mass consciousness by the working class of itself as a class and its independent interests in a single country. The independent class party of the working class in the broadest sense is necessarily an international party. Indeed, it is increasingly the case that cooperation of the working class in international trade union organizations is essential to defending the immediate interests of workers in the direct class struggle. Uh, Lexi, I, I might ask you to come in on this a little bit, but remember when sure. we were critiquing the Red Party, we were talking about the merger formula? This is the yeah. thing that takes it the most for granted. Mm. That there isn't just an international labor movement, but there's a roughly equal and equally developed international labor movement. And I don't yeah. even know how that happens. Like, Yeah, and even with the most charitable read of, you know, the socialist movement bringing revolutionary politics to the labor movement, if you have an international labor movement, I think you basically already have the turn that most revolutionaries could potentially be like the political perspective that revolutionaries most need to bring to the labor movement. I don't think it's even consciously like communist all the time. That is the important turn, but it's a turn towards international class interest. That is the most difficult and sort of politically you know, it's it's like underdetermined by everything else. This is the thing most open to agency, and it's it's a question of which class interests will the class develop and defend when they come together. Are are they going to like what? How do they see themselves? It's that understanding of themselves as an international class mm -hmm. that revolutionaries can most bring to the labor movement, to the socialist movement. It it isn't that you know actually the broader stuff about Marxist theory, which like a lot of which, you know, either than perhaps labor theory of value and historical materialism or whatever, like a lot of which can just sort of be developed from the situation. It's a logic that emerges from understanding yourself as part of an international struggling class. The key thing, as you said, is the working class understanding itself as an international class and a thing that we need to try to oppose within the working class movement, the number one thing to oppose is siding with the national bourgeoisie. But that's difficult because, and as we've talked about in the past, there is a short-term instrumental gain sometimes to be had by siding with your national bourgeoisie. Kind of a digression, but like I think in terms of national liberation as like a temporary way to get colonizers out, I understand why people would ally with the national bourgeoisie. But for everybody present here, there isn't really a reason for us to do that in our nation states, in London, in Canada. Fifteen dollars an hour. Fifteen dollars an hour. I mean, there's yeah, nothing wrong. I mean, there's nothing wrong with like you know struggling for like better wages and stuff like that. But there's a difference between 
it's kind of like goes back to like the revolution versus reform kind of thing. Like there is no reason why a, an international communist working class movement can't struggle for better conditions. And in the meantime, but their, their sights should always be set on the long-term goal of we are an international class. Certainly. Uh, I think that's the right end goal to have in mind, but yeah, I just, I see the, workers' movement and the socialist movement in Canada constantly trying to angle for allying with the national bourgeoisie. The analysis absolutely makes sense, and I see the ways in which that's self-defeating. But, sorry, you also see when you look at the workers' organizations, the trade unions and so on, their, their analysis is oriented towards basically just getting enough bargaining power with the national bourgeoisie to get some concessions like that that's the extent of their horizons so it's kind of like their horizons are set by the national bourgeoisie even if they sometimes end up in opposition with them i also think it's worth like questioning the degree to which the bourgeoisie is actually national because at least in the case of canada that's very much only partially true and yet they will still engage in nationalist discourse in order to like box workers into thinking that way. You actually hit the nail on the head when you said like they, it's a trick, right? Like for the most part, the bourgeoisie is international. There are some blocks that are more national, but as we've been discussing, like capital is an international class and so is the working class, but politically within a nation state, right? They will pit workers of one nation state against another like you see that a lot in the in the southwest usa where i live like they want to point the finger at mexican and you know south american and central american immigrants as a problem as taking our jobs as as our competitors right instead of like our internet as part of an international class you will get often get workers parties that in essence act more nationally then the bourgeois class will function, right? It, it is by and large a trick. That's why rhetorically we got to point out the kind of class compromises and the period of social democracy has failed, right? Like that, that has all, all of those gains have been eroded away over time. That's my biggest talking point with liberals who want to keep trying to get these class compromises. And that's their end goal because they don't see communism is tenable and i you know i deeply get like how unrealistic all this seems but the, the reason why i have i'm thinking that way thinking that this all seems super unrealistic like mm -hmm. logically i still advocate for it because i think it's even more unrealistic to get that kind of social democracy back like i think it's it's, it's the political willpower and the part of the bourgeoisie just isn't there and if we do get it, like, how long until it gets, we lose it again? I'm going to invoke the spirit of my former left communism a bit, but you have to do more than critique social democracy. And the reason why you have to do more than critique social democracy is that social Democrats were actually, in their own limited way, more international than the anti-colonial movements were. And it's yeah, like the anti-colonial movements were international. They have been subsumed by a new form of, of debt leveraging out of China, which mm -hmm. we being the majority of socialists, if you were to democratically pull socialist on the left, would stand for. Just to be clear, I'm not advocating only criticizing social democracy. I'm just talking about a specific counter argument to a specific argument. Right. Well, but I, I want to go deeper in this because this is a bigger problem than I think... I, I, I'm always doing this in this sh in this show, but like, there's a, it's more than just fake or a trick that makes us nationalist. In so much that our economies are organized along firms that are both national and internationally aligned, and and in many ways, the bourgeois is more internationalized than the working class is. In a way that it's hard to communicate even though we know the, the proletariat, quote unquote, is an international class. And, and part of that is because we exist within these, these larger structural, you know, you know what Manier calls firms. There's a left com critique of unionism that I think goes too far, but it, it's something to remind yourself of. 
you can only do unionism, our social democratic policy, in a capitalist, profitable polity. You, you really can. I mean, you can only get higher wages if there's money to take. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're actually advocating impossibilism. And we know how Marx felt about that. He thought that was a lie and would turn people against the, the socialist in France. And he was pretty correct, actually. So, like, but this is this is a bind I've never heard a good answer to from anybody, including Marx himself. How, how we if we know that the concessions we need are only possible in a profitable capitalist market, we know that any concessions that we make to get those concessions to ourselves, which would make the working class more militant and does, historically speaking, this is correct, but it also makes capitalism stronger. If we accelerate the, the capitalism, we actually weaken the working class by weakening their, their ability to survive. But we might be weakening capitalism at the same time, but at the expense of working class where other third, fourth weird positions start to emerge. I don't know how we deal with this, with this little like post-it note outline. I mean, like this is so idealistic in a way that I really don't know how you handle this, honestly, because the trade unions are necessary and they're good. And if we had them internationally, it'd be great, but they're also highly limited and need a successful capitalist nation state to be effective. Right. And that, that's, that's, that's exactly the, the, the difficulty, right? Is that they're effective within a national context. And if they were to try to organize internationally, like actually that's, I, I shouldn't say if they were to, because I know like in Europe, there have been efforts to actually organize internationally and it's extremely difficult. Like there are so many ways in which state boundaries make coordination very, very hard, even in a, a place like Europe where there's freedom of movement, like things like, oh, the national holidays don't line up. The bargaining agreements don't line up. It, it feels like the capitalist control of the state gives such an enormous advantage because, yeah, capital is international. And yet it operates through the state, which creates barriers for labor that are real and actually structure the potential for advances. Yeah, this also just sort of points to me how much of like an uphill battle this is and how this is something that happens in a time bounded window. I'm not prepared to be, a you know, a full go full communizer about it and say that this is a sort of unrolling process that all happens quite, you know, almost suddenly. H however, yeah, like it's going to be pretty hard not only to build popular power where you are, but then do the extra associational work. You know, the bourgeoisie, they just let the status quo operate and they can focus on association. It's a, it's a way different fight. And I also tend to have this conversation, yes, in terms of short to medium term versus like long-term class interest, because... This is usually the argument that's used to do away with the concept of class interest, that we don't know who we are and therefore who our interests are, you know, what our interest is, is, is uh, contingent upon who we decide, you know, we are. But I, I think ultimately we are still talking about long-term proletarian interests versus, you know, whatever deal you can cut with people that are, I mean, they're not your neighbors exactly, but they're more in your vicinity than, you know, the people that the international working class concept is asking you to identify with. So this, this is going to be an uphill battle. You usually in these days get like a s flashes of class unity by sort of resonant imitation and slogans that cross, you know, language barriers and, and geographical barriers. It happens in a kind of weird magic meme -y way. You know, that process isn't like well accounted for in the Marxist party tradition that McNair is trying to recover. Trying to like put these things together is going to provide a, a, a significant challenge. But, you know, hey, if we logically stand by this framework or something, then we have to figure out how these two worlds talk to each other. It, it may very well be that they can't or that by using this book's metric, you have to look at different the possibility of using different strategies in different places or what have you. But, you know, it's clear that we have our work cut out for us, comrades. 
Yeah, and I, I just wanted to bring up, like, I, I think I'm also thinking from too limited of a perspective here because, you know, there is real organizing work being done across international supply lines through organizations like Amazon, right? There, there is real attempts by unions to coordinate at that level. They're happening. It's just very hard. So I, I shouldn't think, like, I, I feel like my, I, I'm suffering from a bit of parochialism here by thinking from, like, this Albertan context where the unions are just pretty, pretty high-bound and narrow-minded and tied to, like, resource extraction in a very particular area. If you were to imagine, say, somewhere like Europe now, like, I don't think there'd be too much antagonism between the working class, say, of Ireland or Britain or France or Germany. But when you say that the communist, ex-communist bloc, Eastern countries that have a lower level of development, like, you know, there is a threat within that, say, if you were to say everywhere west of the Urals was a European continental bloc under McNair's schema, like, there would be tension between, like, French workers and Bulgarian workers. There just would. So how kind of homogenous do you need this block to be, you know, to be able to develop functioning international unions? Because like if you're a union, are you going to go with the international union and say if you're in Bulgaria and there's like a German car plant to get put there? Are you going to say, no, 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 I don't want to screw over my German workmates? Like, is that really going to work or is it going to work if you're all in a continental block, say, say exclude the ex-communist ones just for now and say, oh, they want to move it to like, you know, somewhere outside our block. Let's all unite against that firm. It seems like this strategy might need some more like homogeneity of, of economic development to work. I think there's an argument to be made that like, if you're have seeing an increase in capital exports, that's like a portion of the product that can't be invested proper. You know, it's because there's no profitable investment opportunities in your country. So it's like, even if a firm did stay in your country, it's not necessarily true that your growth rate would increase from this investment or your long-term growth rate. Like you, you're a worker, you're not thinking about your country's long-term growth rate. You're thinking, I'm going to lose my goddamn job now with some guy in like, I don't know, Vladivostok is going to get my job. Like, and a lot of times firms move not because they're not getting profit where they are, is that they get more profit where they can go. Yeah, but I think like, I think it's easy to like, turn this into like an, like solidarity because it's like, you know, it's not like the person in Vladivostok. It's like the system that you're in. That's, you know, it's like the dynamics of a system that's doing that. It's not like the person, you know, it's not like, you can't have solidarity between this person because the system works a certain way. You know, if it was that easy, we'd do it though. I mean, that's, that's the, end of the day. we do it now. Yeah, precisely. Uh, and, and, but, and I mean, it, it exists in some limited sense now, but it's limited and it's also really easy to crush. To bring it back to Kyle's point, look what happened to the GM workers in Mexico that tried to support the American striking workers. One, there's tension because the American striking workers do actually somewhat benefit uh, from things, you know, some concessions that that, are, that the Mexican workers couldn't possibly get, but under the current system, and I want to say never, but like, but but even beyond that, there was still solidarity there. They were immediately crushed with no recourse, more than the, the striking workers in the U.S. were, and that's despite NAFTA extending legal protections in both countries to both groups of of workers. I mean, that's with an international legal agreement backing it up. You, you start dealing with those things without those international legal agreements, which are bourgeois agreements in the first place, you have a much bigger problem. And having like, I, I, I'm going to like talk actually from experience a little bit now. I've done observing of labor issues in East Asia and in North Africa with striking workers. They get nationalist really damn fast. And they, they often start off in solidarity, actually. But the moment there's any kind of tension, there's a tendency to turn to who you can get access to. And the people you can get access to are usually the working class of a different country that work within your borders. And that's within the borders of a country, divided on ethno-nationalist lines. To just say that that's easy to overcome seems to just be like, it, I don't know. Like, it's just... It, it hasn't happened yet. 
Uh, how much do you think so, language barriers are like it? Uh, it wouldn't explain it in Korea because the, the the Southeast Asian workers speak Korean, but in some ways, yes, language barriers are who problem. Oh, but yeah, that's kind of going away now that English is being more like commonly spoken around the world. What about Esperanto? <laughs> it's coming back, baby. It's coming back. <laughs> oh God! How come, how, how come there's two genders in Esperanto? You get a chance to fucking design a whole language, and you, anyway. Rip. A friend of mine, um, a friend of mine's father spent like twenty years doing like an Esperanto to something. Like, it's hardly Irish dictionary, like Gaelic Irish or something. Oh my god! <clears throat> Wait, es- Esperanto? That's like an international language. <laughs> Team Esperanto, baby! <laughs> Woo! This isn't like a really good fix for all these problems. These real problems that y'all are bringing up and real difficulties. But I think. One, like we have to look at long game and we are nowhere near attempting anything at this point. That That's just a fucking fact. But two, one of the things that we have to uh, go off of, you know, kind of going off of what like Lexi was saying earlier, like we have to kind of create something new with all the tools at our, at our feet. And I think like better than any particular party or the Soviet Union or anything, like looking at the and McNair will do this a little bit later on, I, th- I think, or he did it in, the, in one of the previous chapters, but we need to look at like the things that the first international and the second international did well. We also need to look at all the things that the third and fourth international did terribly. And look at those facets, look at some, some maybe newer stuff like cybernetics and, you know, part of the issue too of like, how do we do the, how do we do the kind of internationalism that I was talking about that doesn't fall, fall into federalism? I don't know. It's it's hard to imagine from our standpoint the categories of the society that that we're already in providing any um, like kind of emancipatory pull of resin or workers politics, you know? Work working I- working class identity. And that's a concept and a framework that's like thoroughly sort of colonized by like nationalist ideas in in our kind of given framework. And yeah, it's possible that a lot of what McNair is talking about will happen with a different kind of, you know, language will happen under like the content could be the same, but the words might be all different. McNair's like interest in the second international is the role of a symbolic concept of international workers unity. And that content might have different kind of trappings in the 21st century in a way that will be hard to predict. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats. Also, Sophie from the panel and Trans Trans Revolution is starting a new podcast called Jumpsuit Utopia, all about Star Trek and communism. It'll be joining the Emancipation Network soon, so make sure to check it out. The format of the show will be discussing particular classic Star Trek episodes from a commie perspective, and regular panellists include the usual Emancipation Network superstars and myself, 